again welcome to automation direct media we're on to part two of how to select the correct PLC so we're gonna go through nine steps of selecting a PLC these nine steps can also be found in our catalog and if you browse around on our website you can find some information of how to uh, select the correct PLC for your application and we'll go through and go through these nine steps and hopefully we can help you out with this when we get done we'll give you some resources at the end of part three and uh, show you where you can find more information step one proposed system you need to look at a couple of different things new or existing you know if it's an existing PLC how compatible is it if you pull out a brand X and put in a brand Y uh, will the brand wise cards work with all the devices out there are they going to be the same ranges are the devices that are you know tied to it going to work with that new PLC um, you need to look at will the new PLC fit in the old cabinet stuff like that power requirements um, most times you're going to either be using 24 volts DC um, 120 volts or 220 volts AC for your modules also your power source is going to be the same some people get into low voltage lines or TTL which are usually below 10 volts some of them are very small size constraints like I said is it a new enclosure how big of an enclosure can you put in the area how big of a PLC can you put in that enclosure if it's an existing system will your PLC fit in that enclosure and also think of the future you know, will this system ever need to be expanded? Will it need to be networked? Will it need to have more I.O.? Will it need a bigger PLC? If you need a bigger PLC, can you put a bigger PLC in the cabinet? If not, is there room for another cabinet? How far will that cabinet have to be? So always think of this. Think ahead. Environmental. Temperatures are a big factor. Had customers that build a system, find out the machine or the product is going in some harsh environment, could be on a ship deck, could be in some very hot environment, could be in a very cold environment. Temperatures are a big issue here, so you need to make sure that uh, you are going to be in that range. If not, you need to think about adding things like either a heater to your enclosure if you're in cold environments, or some type of air conditioner or uh, cooling system in the enclosure, which we do sell the Vortex coolers for our enclosures. Or you get up some of the larger ones, you can get air conditioners for them. So always keep that in mind. There is a spec that you know, any manufacturer of PLCs will put on the PLC. If it goes above or below, you will see some erratic problems with the uh, processors and so forth. Dust, water, and harsh environments. Class 1 Div 2, explosion proof stuff. Some customers have to have explosion proof PLCs or equipment. Let's just say for instance if you were putting this in a paint booth, uh, stuff is very flammable. You don't want a uh, relay opening and shutting and arcing in a paint booth. It could explode. So that's just an example. We do have Class 1 Div 2 uh, products. Code related issues always keep in mind your local and national electric codes you need to contact your local authorities to find out what those are because every let's just say city might have something different if you're in their city limits discrete IO okay how many AC and DC inputs are required well let's back up a second discrete IO what is discrete IO that just means AC inputs and DC inputs or AC outputs and DC outputs and uh, also relays um, you have discrete you have analog which we'll get to that in a minute then you get into specialty stuff so discrete IO we have some voltages you need to make sure that uh, whatever device you're going to put to the input or the output that it is going to be in that range so you might have to pick your PLC based on that you might actually have to pick a PLC card based on that what are specific voltages of each like brick PLCs are what we call fixed IO you either buy it with AC or DC inputs or you buy it with AC DC or relay outputs so if you buy one with AC inputs and relay outputs as we have noted here then that's all you're going to be able to wire up is AC inputs and relay outputs. If you find that you've got a DC uh, sensor, can't wire it up. Not without some type of conversion, which is going to make it a little tough. Modular PLCs, you can mix and match the I.O. So you can have an abundance of sources. You know, you got AC, you got DC, whatever you need, relay out, DC out. You can have all that mixed and matched. Step four is the analog I.O. What is analog? Well, analog can be things like RTDs, thermocouples, as we show here, 0 to 20 or 4 to 20, 0 to 10 volts, 
uh, plus or minus 10 volts, and so forth. What this is for is, let's just say I've got a potentiometer. Well, you need to feed it uh, in and out with analog, or let's just say I've got some type of a level switch that's going to use analog, let's say a scale. Sometimes scales will actually have analog. Flow meters, if it's measuring water passing through a pipe, it's going to use an analog signal. So that's when you get into analog. Some brick units cannot use analog. They don't have the availability for it. Let's just say our 105 is fixed. No analog on it. Uh, or the 105. When you get into the 05 has one option slot, so you could possibly put an analog card in there. The 06, you could put analog. Any of the other PLCs, you could add them. RTD inputs and thermocouple inputs for uh, temperatures. And also, as you can see here, the thermocouples, you can use these for millivolt ranges. So if you have some really small voltage inputs, you can use the thermocouple. Specialty modules. Get into the specialty modules when we get into high-speed counters. We have several different high-speed counters. We have a CTRIO for uh, most of the PLCs, including the BRICS. The CTRINT is for the 205, and the HSC, uh, we have that for a 405. The BRICS offer built-in high-speed counters on some modules. So any of the BRICS, the 05, 105, and 06, if you buy one that has DC inputs, it will have a high-speed counter built in. You just wired up those first couple of inputs, configure the PLC for it, and you can read things like encoders, positioning, servo stepping, all that, you'd use some high-speed stuff. ASCII inputs or outputs. Well, what's ASCII and what I need it for or what would I need it for? Um, let's just say ASCII, you might need it for a barcode reader. Some scales might use some ASCII. Basic programming, you might need something special. Well, there's what's called CoPro modules, and these are offered for some PLCs like the 205 and the 405. CPU requirements. How much memory am I going to need? Well, it's tough to say. You need to sort of have to guess and say, okay, am I going to use a PLC to control one small conveyor and maybe five boxes going down there? Conveyor, no, you wouldn't need a whole lot of memory. But let's just say I want to control a plant with one PLC and it's going to have a thousand I.O. and it's going to be doing all kinds of tasks with analog and high-speed counters and I need to read barcode labels. Well, you're going to start eating up some memory when you start writing your ladder logic to program the PLC. So keep in mind that. Um, also, everybody's going to program a little bit differently. There's no right or wrong way to get from point A to point B. Everybody just gets around in a different way. So one programmer might be able to program a task using 10 lines. Another programmer might do the same task and use 50 lines. So that's always going to depend on... Uh, how you program will depend on how much memory you use as well. PID loops. Well, PID, what is PID? It's proportional integral derivative. And this is used for analog inputs and outputs. And basically, let's just, a uh, good example, cruise control on your car. When you get going down the road and you're at 55 miles an hour and you hit set, you want your car to stay at 55. If you start going down a hill, it's going to try to limit you. If you're going up a hill, it's going to give it more gas. Well, basically, that's what PID would do. If you say, I want my pump to run exactly at this pump speed, then the PID is going to look at your inputs and give you some output based on that, and it will change. Okay, if you need PIDs, you need to look at different CPUs. Not all of them have PID. Floating point math. Well, what is that? Well, if you're going to add things, say 2 plus 2 equals 4, you don't really need a big honking massive CPU with lots of power. If you need to get into floating point math and you need to start looking at decimal points, well, then you need to get up in the higher level CPUs like 250, 260, 450. Okay, next thing, special communications. Do you think you're going to need it? Do you know if you're going to need it? Remote I.O. You're going to need to network PLCs to PLCs. You're going to need to talk to other devices such as HMI or another say computers are in the plant on a network so forth. Remote I.O. means I have one PLC and it's controlling several other racks of PLCs at other locations or even locally. Step 7 is I.O. locations. This is a little bit more about the remote I.O. basically. 
okay will all of my I.O. fit in one rack well let's say that I fill up a 205 system and I need more inputs and outputs well I can buy another 205 rack put an expansion module in it and a communications module for that and start adding more I.O. the first PLC will control the second you can keep adding more as you see this picture over on the right hand side we have a 205 and it has an expansion drop down to another rack drop down to another rack drop down to another rack this first PLC is controlling all of these racks so you need to make sure that you have all the requirements or you meet all the requirements for this you have all the uh, modules to do this if you need it and keep in mind the future expansion stuff if you know that sometime in the future you're going to expand more you know can I use remote IO do I have the right products 250 or 260 processor you can use expansion or remote IO either one okay expansion pretty much a plug and go the processor sees all of the IO and uh, basically you just write the code as you would if all the inputs and outputs were in one PLC system or one rack you need to look at distance of your racks how far apart are they going to be in the 205 expansion you can go up to 90 feet away if you need to go further than that well you're going to have to go to remote IO it's a little bit different you have to program for your inputs and outputs that are out at those slave racks um, but you can go further distances if you need some real far distances you can look at uh, uh, we can get into fiber optic modules that are master and slave so fiber optic of course carries communications a lot further remote IO when we're looking at that you need to look at what will be my master what will be my slaves how many slave racks and so forth like I said the distance is always going to be an issue how do you run the distance um, how can you run the wires? I've had guys say, well, I've got to go underneath a river and I only have one piece of conduit and there's all kinds of power wires ran in there. Well, it's not good practice to run communications wires with power. If that's the only option you have, I'm sorry, it's still not good. So you need to make sure that you have the proper uh, availability to run what you need to run. Communications. Well, as you can see here, this one PLC is communicating with a handful of different uh, other outside devices. We've got Ethernet going to a switch, going to other PLCs, so it's networked to these PLCs. It's going to a drive here. We've got a high-speed uh, counter going to some stuff. We've got uh, servos. We've got uh, breakout of one Ethernet communications card, and we're going to another computer and several HMI touch panels got barcode readers, we've got uh, scales, all kinds of other HMIs, more drives, maybe it's going back to a plant computer that's uh, reading all kinds of information over the plant. Uh, maybe this computer is outside of the plant so it's got to go through some type of communication. As you can see here this is a modem, a telephone modem or a modem. So it's going through the uh, MDM tel modem and uh, talking to a computer. So you need to make sure that you have all the right communications. This can get a little complicated if you're not real familiar, so you might have to get some outside help. But if networking, Ethernet, Modbus is a big uh, universal communication, DeviceNet, Profibus, and ASCII, like I said, ASCII, stuff like barcodes. Okay, step nine. We're almost at the end here. Step nine is programming. You have a couple of different options when you program our PLCs. You can either use software, which I highly recommend, or you can use a handheld programmer. Software, you're going to need a computer. You're going to need to either be able to bring the PLC to your desktop computer, or you need a laptop or some way to get your computer out to the plant floor. But your laptop's great. You can take it out next to the machine, plug it up, and you can program or test your program while you're at the machine. You don't necessarily have to be out there to program it, but to test it, you would like to be out there. So do you have all this equipment? Do you have laptops? Um, held handheld programming. All you need is a little handheld, and it looks just like this picture here. Personally, I'd rather somebody hit me in the foot with a hammer than have to use a handheld programmer. There's a lot of people that were trained on these, raised on these, brought up with handheld programmers. That's all they want to use. They don't want to touch a computer. They don't know how to touch a computer. So they're good with handheld programmers, but they can be very time-consuming trying to figure one out. Memory modules. Um, let's just say, for instance, the DDL05, the little brick unit. You can buy this little D0-01MC, which is a memory card or a memory slot, um, and you can pop it into a 05. 
you can suck the program onto this little memory module and then you can send it out to your customer an OEM could do this, you could send it out to your buddy and say hey I've got a new program on this memory module, pop it in your 05 and run it so he can pop it in and either he can transfer that program into the memory of his uh, 05 or he can keep it on this memory module and just run off of it so if you make changes for somebody and they don't have the capabilities to either uh, use the software or transfer with software or you just don't want them in there me messing with it you can send them this little memory module also there's some chips for say the 405 some of the 405 processors there are little memory chips you can program to those send that little chip out a little card out and they can pop it in the processor and let it run off of it so easy way to data transfer get them a new project out there that we don't have to touch with it Okay, that's pretty much it for the step nine or the nine steps of choosing a PLC. Please follow us along to the uh, third portion of this, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some examples, break our PLCs down, and also give you some resources.